Hello, dear students. This is Professor Dr. Zia Ahmed for my MA English students, third semester, wherever they belong to, maybe in Emerson, maybe in Namal, or anywhere else. I'm live here. So if any one of you has got so far, give in the comment section your presence by writing OK or by writing any words to show your presence so that I can start with today's lecture. This is Hafsa Khan, first of all, who is the student of MPhil English, but she is very active in learning something from my lectures. So even before the targeted students, she's there. Unless one of the targeted students comes up, we cannot start with that. Let's have a little wait before we start with. Hafsa Khan, can you let me know that my voice and my picture and uh, uh, everything you can see very clearly and listen it clearly? Is that so? All right, here is Valid Asghar also. So now the time has come that we should start. Uh, all of you know that these series of lectures are being designed to save you people from horrible problems coming up because of the coronavirus. The safe environment has been designed through online lectures. So it's being done all for you. So everyone is required to participate in that and to get benefit out of that. I must say that we uh, have been studying Ice Candy Man. The last lecture also, we discussed one chapter. And here in today's lecture, we shall be discussing chapter nine and chapter 10 of the book. The textbook, Bepsi Sidwa's Ice Candy Man, uh, which has also been titled as Cracking India. We are familiar with all these things before time. Uh, we shouldn't waste our time in repeating all that. So first of all, let me show you the chapter that we are going to start today. I hope everybody is able to look at the chapter. Chapter nine is there. And that chapter has many significant things in that. Uh, before we start with that, let me tell you that the chapter will be talking about many other characters as well. Uh, like it can be Mrs. Penn as well. It can be uh, Aunt Electric Aunt, or it can be any other characters too. Uh, so in that way, chapter nine is not that significant to pay much attention to it. But however, whatever is significant here, I shall be talking about that. And your discussions and questions will be welcome later on at the end of our lecture. So first of all, uh, take the second page of uh, chapter, and you will be able to see one small passage in the green highlight. Uh, the passage is here that I'm going to read for you. It says, the kitchen door banging shut, Yusuf emerges to investigate the row. He snatches Adi up and Rosie, dragged to her feet by her hair, emits a bloody yell that curdles the milk in Mrs. Mr. Singh's buffaloes. Yusuf carries Adi kicking and cursing into the kitchen. A very insignificant part of the text, but still, we need to know that uh, the text is beginning or the chapter is beginning at the home of uh, Lenny and the characters like Yusuf and her brother Adi, they are taking part in that and some of the animals are also there. And because of these, some row or some conflict or some noise has developed and this noise has brought the attention of everybody on the things which are happening outside. So with this background, let's proceed further and reach the uh, next significant lines as uh, the lines are here, leaving, starting with the word leaving, leaving Rosie to cope with her hurt feelings and bruised flesh, I crouch before them. One by one, I lift the fragile jars and remove their tiny crystal stoppers. They gleam reflecting rainbow, hues, insinuating questions. What is eternity? Why are the stars? Where do cats lay their eggs? And why? Don't hospitals have flushing bedpans built into the beds? Some of these questions which Lenny is putting are very childish, innocent questions. For example, what are the stars? Where do the cats lay their eggs? Very innocent questions. But on the other hand, there is one question which is very philosophical as well. For example, they gleam reflecting rainbow hues, insinuating questions. What is eternity? What are the stars? This uh, this type of question remind me of Keats and Shelley's poems where they put the questions to, to the shining things. Uh, as as uh, one of the poets has said that life is like a dome of many colored glass where the light of eternity enters and provides different colors and ultimately 
everything finishes. So similar type of questions are raised by Webster's Dwyer as well, from the tongue of a child, not only signifying, signifying how does a child think, but also trying to convey us the type of sense that whatever is happening, we are perhaps not paying that much attention to such questions as we should have done. But here in this paragraph, the most important thing is the jar, the jars, three jars, which are the, made up of crystal, and they are they are very beautiful, shining, and Lenny is trying to hide them, and she will be hiding in next chapter as well. She will be taking care of that. How does a girl take care of such things? That is also pointed out here. Let me take you to the next page. I think everybody is following. Uh, here on the next page, we have very interesting thing that lends the color of romance to this novel. Uh, like on this page, uh, I have circled two words, Aya and Patan. But alongside that, we should also add Chinaman. So here begins the new list of the lovers of Aya. Uh, that means Shanta. She is young and beautiful and admirable. So that is why we have two new lovers, Chinaman and Patan. These two lovers are new for us. We uh, should keep in mind the previous lovers, as you people read in the class as well. So. Now onward, a few pages will be dedicated to the lovers who are Chinaman and Pathan. For example, if I take you to the next page, again, the green text is available. Uh, it says that the Chinaman is dapper, thin, brusque, and rude. He parks his bicycle in the porch, removes the cycle clips from his hockey trouser, and leaves his, and heaves his bundle to the veranda. Come on, come on, Chinaman, come, he shouts, squaring before his bundle and sorting out his wares for display. Come on, main up, come on, Aya, come on, come on, Chinaman, come. Mother yells from inside, tell him to get out. What is this nonsense? Coming every day, Aya, Yusuf, is anyone there? Aya comes to the veranda, go, go, she says in tart English. Besides Cantonese, the Chinaman speaks only smattering of English, main up, no want, go, go. So here's the China man who has been introduced to be thin in size, but very rude as well and brusque as well. He's coming on the bicycle and brings his wear to display in the home or around the home of Lanny. And there his purpose mainly not only is to sell his things, but also to attract the attention of Aya. So he uses the word, come on, come on, Aya. And Aya perhaps knows this, that for her he has come there and he would like to show his wear as well. But as the sound or the voice of Lenny's mom comes there, that why he should be allowed to come daily and why he should display his articles daily, he may be thrown out. And that's why she calls some of the people at home, like Yusuf, to come and remove this man. And the man goes out by saying certain words, which are, go, go, she says in tart, and the answer is, main sub, no want, go, go. So that's a particular type of Pakistani style English. Whatever the meaning may be, whatever the style may be, the purpose is to convey the message to the people and that is why he says that i'm getting disappointed so that's why i'm going out so this is the entry and the departure of one of the lovers in this chapter that is the china man let's keep in mind what he said what he did in order to relate it with the other lover for example if we proceed further down to a new passage for example here another green passage is there which says the attention of aya aya spartan admirer also benefit our household all our kitchen knives, table knives, mother's scissors and paper knives and Ari's garden, shears and Adi's blunt pen knife certainly develop glittering razor edges. And it's not only our household, the Patan services, Gita Shankar's, Rosie Peters, electric aunts and godmother's houses all flash with sharp and efficient cutting implements. Even the worn stubby knives in the servant's quarter acquire redoubtable edges for the Patan is a knife sharpener. So uh, here is where the passage goes to indicate uh, that the passage is about Pathan Sharbat Khan. Sharbat Khan's basic business is, as the paragraph indicates, that he's the knife sharpener. So he sharpens the edges of the knives, and the writer tells us that all kind of knives which are staying at the houses of all the people mentioned in the passage, these knives were dull. But as soon as the uh, Sharbat Khan, the Pathan, comes, he sharpens all the edges of the knives so that's a type of profession mostly 
in the 40s and 60s, the people, Pathan people came on the bicycles and they had a stone, the wetting stone on their bicycle. And with the help of that, they would sharpen the knife. So in that way, one of the occupations which most of the Pathans would like to have, that has been indicated. But alongside that, we also find that he is the source of attraction for most of the people because he sharpens the edges of the things. That's the profession of this Pathan. This Pathan, the Sherbat Khan is more welcome as compared to the Chinaman that he is given entry uh, in a way that the kitchen where goes to him and he sharpens all these things and that way he becomes the important person. But how much is important that is still to be seen and let's go forward in order to see what kind of importance he's going to assume. So the text again uh, going down and here is another uh, passage that is about his name. The Pathan's name is Sherbat Khan. He too cycles up our long drive, steel chattering and wheels wobbling over the rubble that sticks out of the mud. The cycle looks like a toy beneath the man from the mountains and involuntarily Adi and I grow tense, expecting the pistol shot like report of a punctured tire. It's late in the afternoon and we stand on the veranda, hypnotized by his approach. Sherbat Khan wears drawstring pantaloons so baggy they put shim Mosir Shalwar and over him a flare tunic that flaunts 10 yards of course white homespun. He cycles past our bedroom and Gita Shankar's room to the back of the house. Adi and I scoot after him. Sherbat Khan parks his cycle against his tree and sequiting by it waits for Aya and Aya comes. So this is the passage again that goes to talk about the uh, Pathan and his, uh, you know, the baggy trouser and the dresses which he wears and the way he comes and the way he becomes important for Aya and for other people as well. So he is almost more welcome as compared to the other people in the house and Aya particularly visits him, comes to see him. And in that way, he assumes a special type of importance as we can see in that passage. For example, uh, he is compared with Masir with respect to the Shalwar and Shim word has been used for him that Masir was not that important as the Pathan was there and when his cycle would come all the boys and girls, the children, they would run in order to go behind him so in that way he becomes the most important person among the lovers of Aya. Now we are required to see in by going next of the passage to find out uh, what more is there with respect of that uh, this Pathan becomes more important. For example, the passage which is being displayed before you on the screen reads like this, Sherbat Khan cautions Aya, these are bad times, Allah knows what's in store, there's big trouble in Calcutta and Delhi, Hindu Muslim trouble, the Congress Walas are after Jinnah's blood. Uh, what is it to us if Jinnah, Nehru and Patel fight? They are not figuring out our fight, says Aya lightly. Now here are two important statements. One is given by Sharbat Khan and the second uh, statement is given by Aya as you can find. Uh, let me keep it before you for a moment so that you can feel that. Here uh, Patan is showing his worry and upsetness that and there could be some trouble because of the high level conflicts of po uh, politics going on in India. And he shows his concern that Kaidiyazan's life may be in threat. Uh, Aya says that what is going to happen? What kind of benefit is going to come to her, even if they fight and if they don't fight? So Patan's concern is the concern of the higher level that because he goes outside as a male, he is experiencing and witnessing things. But I has been remaining at home as a girl, as a woman, does not realize the gravity of the situation. She's listening to the reports, but doesn't give any importance to that. So in that way, uh, some people were aware of the politics going on at that time, and some people were totally unaware. That is why both the point of views have been talked about by Sidwa in this portion of her text. Now, let me take you to the next portion where uh, up to some extent uh, this Sherbat Khan will become even more important. Uh, for example, if you look at these two passages, uh, a particular type of profession mostly related to the Pathans in our country, especially that has been talked about. For example, Sherbat Khan takes the money from her and removing his turban, tucks it inside into a rancid smelling interior. His hair, matter to his head, is brown and falls from his center, parting to his ears. Sherbat Khan loans money as a side business, like most Pathans. He carries out transactions on Aya's behalf and gives her the profits. Often he wears a gun. There are few defaulters. So, uh, what is uh, people here? Very important, very significant that Aya is having a business with the collaboration of Sherbat Khan. Uh, the Aya, or 
Shanta, whom we think to be very innocent and simple type of person. That person is collaborating with the Patan in order to lend money on interest base. The profit is going to come to her. So she's not that simple, that innocent. Or we can also say that this is the company of Sharbat Khan, which has made her so clever and so important. And that is why she is going to have investment of money. So this thing lends a type of light color, not only of romance, but of that of the life which is going on at that time. And how I was making efforts to get more and more success in our life that is pointed out through these two paragraphs let me take you to the next passages which are even more significant in uh, this chapter sherbat khan's activity will going will be going on and we may be able to find out something uh, new in in these passages uh, kindly keep looking at the text which is flowing before you uh, some of the people are talking about uh, Nehru and Gandhi and uh, even the talk takes place at the house of Lenny where the father of Lenny, the mom also talked about that. That's not that significant to uh, say, but the end of the chapter is on one significant line, which is the last line of the chapter. If you look at that line, it says that, is that when I learn to tell the tales? So this is the uh, kind of remark which Bapsi Sidwa gives about herself, that remark which according to her is the significant remark because she's listening to the tales told by different people. Sometimes these tales are social, sometimes they're political, and sometimes these tales are financial, sometimes these tales are by the high ups, rich people, sometimes by poor people. And she's listening to these tales and puts the question here that is it because of these tales that she has also started to tell the tale or she has also got this kind of quality in her. Definitely she's got the quality that is why she can write wonderful text for us that we are today enjoying. And besides that, she's got a big power of observation and that power of observation will be visible when we shift ourselves to the next chapter. So boys and girls, let us proceed towards the next chapter. And that is going to be chapter number 10. In chapter number 10, as the start is there, I have written uh, in uh, very big words, Gandhi enters. Chapter 10 starts made with the help of the politics that was going on at that time. But first to read the passage, introductory passage of the chapter and taking some of the clues from here and entering into the reading of the chapter. Instead of school, I go to Miss Penn. Her house is next to Godmother's on Jail Road. Opposite Electric Aunt and I walk there with Aya or with Hari. Chenny, her slight but stately sweeper. This is important for the objective that Chenny is going to be the maid servant, the sweeper of electric horn, takes out a small table and two chairs, and we sit in the garden under bare February trees and lukewarm sunshine. Mr. Penn lounges on the veranda in an easy chair. Where two more characters, two more important characters, one is Mr. Penn, another is Mr. Penn. Ms. Penn gives tutoring or uh, tuition lessons to Lenny, and Lenny perhaps doesn't take much interest in these lessons. And Mr. Penn's observation, Mr. Penn is the target of observation of Lenny most of the time. She pays much attention to him to study him or to see what he's doing and how he's doing. So uh, the chapter will be offering you a number of lines which will be talking about Mr. Penn and Mrs. Penn and their behaviors. And all these passages are important with respect to the power of observation of Lenny in a way this observation is the observation of Pepsi Sidwa, which she is giving and describing to us. Uh, do read these passages in order to find out how much important the power of observation of the writer Pepsi Sidwa is going to be, and that is why she's able to tell the tales and concoct the stories as well. And the power of observation also makes the stories to be very interesting. For example, uh, there is a comparison given in two lines on, the, on this page that is interesting to know, and after that, we go forward. Uh, about Mr. Penn uh, and Mrs. Penn, Sidwa says he's much darker than Mrs. Penn. He's all, he is Anglo-Indian. Mrs. Penn is fair, soft, plump, English. So these two statements once again remind me of the post theory where the Indian would be uh, termed as a man or a person in dark color and the English would be termed again in the fair color white color. So the contrasting thing as it happened in the last chapters as well, again, it is happening to show that Indians are not fair in color and the English people in comparison to them are fair or whiter. So the importance again being given as in the short story, uh, the ghost of Rosh Shabak, the, the, the writer uh, that is uh, Rohinton mystery, he gives the importance, he shows the importance of white color. Again, here is the importance of white color of the English people. That's the uh, kind of support or, or, or the kind of thinking of the of the Parsi people for the Indian as well as that of the English. So these are the things which are important. And I advise all the students to 
note these passages and go through them in order to find how much power of observation of learning is going to be. And in return, this is actually the power of observation of Bapsi Sidwa herself. So the discussion of Mr. Penn and Mrs. Penn goes on. And after that, Lenny enters into the house of uh, godmother and the slave sister. How do they live? A lot of description is given there. That is not important for us, uh, though it's important for the students to go through that, but not important to be talked about on this line, online lecture. Uh, godmother, we have already discussed a lot and slave sister also in the previous chapters. So that is why I am skipping all these pages and uh, taking you to the point where Mr. Gandhi enters actually. Uh, so uh, in that way, there will be a big talk about Gandhi and I have chosen one, two pages to be taught to you. So we shall be taking uh, pairwise one by one. Uh, for this purpose, look at the screen. You have a paragraph which is really very important. Uh, let me read this paragraph for you. And after that, I may be skipping some of the paragraphs and talking to you important things in these paragraphs. Uh, like it is, we walk deep into the winding eucalyptus shade drive. So far and do we go that I fear we may land up in some private traces of the zoo and come face to face with the lion. I drag back on mother's arm, vocalizing my fear. And at last, mother hauls me up some steps and into Gandhiji's presence. He's knitting, sitting cross-legged on the marble floor of the plushal veranda. He's surrounded by women. He is small, dark, shivered. Oh, he looks just like Harry our gardener, except he has disgruntled, disgusted, and irritable look. And no one uh, would dare pull off his dhoti. He wears only the loin cloth, and his black and thin torso is naked. This is the paragraph where Mr. Gandhi is introduced by Lenny or by Bapsa Sidwa. Uh, we have some of the qualities of Mr. Gandhi. Uh, believe me, we are not concerned who was bigger, who was larger, who was greater. We are just discussing whatever has been written in the text. So if the some of the views come from my mouth, it's not because I have any personal views about Mr. Gandhi or Jinnah. It is because the text is projecting all that. And I'm going to discuss these things with you. So he is knitting. That means Mr. Gandhi is doing one job, which is mostly associated with the women, or it has been associated with women, grannies especially, that they keep busy themselves knitting. And the same thing he's doing. Uh, this knitting is not the knitting of a sweater by, uh, you know, by wool. It is the knitting of uh, some other threads which he is doing, and possibly he was famous for that. Uh, sitting across legged on the marble floor of a plush veranda, the second thing is that it's so simple that not sitting on any raised platform or any bed or any chair. He's sitting on the veranda. He's surrounded by, by women, and many women are around him. It's something... Uh, not particularly, but normally strange that why men are not surrounding him, why only women are surrounding. He's small, dark, shriveled old. Now, four words have been used in order to describe his personality. First it was what he was doing, and now it is what type of personality he has, that he's small. He's not big stature, uh, big in structure, rather, we should say, the height. And then he is very lean and thin. He's dark in color. He's shriveled as well. He's old as well. And the comparison Lenny has made with the gardener. Uh, he's got some looks which are very strong looks and because of that uh, Lenny says that it's not possible to talk to him in a very direct way and he was all the time wearing dhoti a loincloth and uh, all the remaining body was naked all the time so this type of leaders used to be there in India at that time when India was awakening itself in the nationalism and was willing to gain freedom from the English occupiers and that is the type of leader we have no 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 whatever the impression may be but this leader is going to be truly Indian truly Hindu leader, that he was more concerned about his mission rather than his appearance. He was more concerned about his philosophy rather than his power of uh, a politician. So that is why this type of introduction has been made. But more so is interesting when we go down the train. Uh, there are some small passages, some big passages, and uh, all these things have been taken in order to show what Gandhi was doing. Uh, and some of the things are very important about him. I am leaving this passage, which begins with mother and I sit. After that, I reach to the passage, lean, young woman, flank Gandhiji. Uh, I shall not be reading these passages for you. Just keep an eye on these passages. But here, something is notable, probably very funny thing for the girls of today who are conscious of their appearance, bodily or physically. Uh, like here, we get the kind of impression when we, these two paragraphs are consulted by us. We see that there are young women around Mr. Gandhi, and all these young women are looking very lean and thin, very smart, actually, as the wish of any girl can be there in order to be so smart. And they look very fresh in skin as well. 
they they look very much uh, you know behaving in a very positive way they have a positive energy and they are looking very happy as well and this is all because mr gandhi says that he has been keeping them their health in such a way let's see how does he keep that and this thing can be made even more understandable uh, when we read what he what mr gandhi said about the people in general for example if you look at the last passage of uh, at this page there is one line in inverted commas where mr gandhi says sluggish stomachs are the scourge of the punjabis it means the smartness thinness and the freshness the freshness of the skin depends on the stomachs if the stomach is filled up more and more if it is having a lot of laziness in it then definitely one is going to lose all these good things but if the stomach is controlled food is controlled one can have very good appearance as well how is it that for example gandhi goes to explain all that when he talks to the mom of lani says that the mom has become you know very fat and she's not so Uh, good and attractive because she is not doing the things as she should have done. For example, Gandhi says to Lenny that uh, uh, system, the bowels or the stomach should be given anima, and a kind of uh, purgation should take place each time with the lukewarm water. And he says that he advises all his followers, especially the women who are surrounding him. He always asks them to clean, keep clean their stomachs by. taking hot water or by taking anima only then one can remain fresh otherwise one cannot so that is why this type of treatment has been suggested by gandhi possibly uh, don't practice it because mr gandhi has expressed and shown it here you know better the world has changed 50 years have passed 70 years have passed now uh, if at that time gandhi had this type of advice you can make a try but uh, always re- always remember that this is going to be a text it's not going to be the thing which will uh, make you look really good sometime it could be problematic as well so consult your doctor first then go to that but i think there is something very good in this advice as well that if one needs to keep one's stomach active and one's skin fresh he taking of the hot water definitely is good one and you people uh, may be enjoying that advice of mr gandhi as well but as a whole if you look at that this is, is it not very strange that uh, the political environment introduced by the writer in the beginning of this chapter should be kept very light by introducing the type of uh, advice from mr gandhi and by introducing to us how did he live that possibly sidwa had a great regard for mr gandhi and the way the philosophy he propagated and the lifestyle he had that is appreciated by uh, sidwa as well and that's why she is saying such things about him but whatever the case may, may be there has been lighted highlighted to be very positive very energetic and very much concerned about his people very philosophic and very much indian as well and perhaps that that's the breed of the of the leaders that existed in the 60s and 40s etc uh, but now perhaps that breed is not available they were more concerned about the people and less concerned about themselves that is why uh, sidwa has chosen to bring that character here uh, let me take you to some other passages in order to conclude this chapter uh, this chapter may be termed as the politically motivated chapter and uh, gandhi's entry into that makes it even more beautiful uh, look at the screen you find the last passage of the chapter let me read this passage for you and after that we'll be able to go to the questions which people may raise it wasn't until some years later when i realized the full scope and dimension of the massacres that i comprehended the concealed nature of the ice lurking deep beneath the hypnotic and dynamic femininity of gandhi's non violent exterior and then when i raised my head again the men lowered their eyes this the kind of thing gandhi's double layers of the characters are possible that on the one hand he was preaching femininity type of attitude i mean the softness the sympathetic attitude towards the people but on the other hand in his name some of the uh, violent behaviors were also being shown uh, it means that what he preached was not being practiced by the people gandhi's preaching was good philosophical and humanitarian based uh, but then that same was not possibly preached by them as well this is not going to be the topic of this uh, whole lesson actually the the kind of political environment has been introduced and these are the passages which make the novel a political novel as well a significant part of the post colonial theory also this is being termed as a pakistani text by babsi sidwa so one can say that it's the heritage it's the history of pakistan as well that is being debated through such uh, narrations or through such chapters so this is all about this chapter number 9 and 10 that i wanted to say to my students here 
I will be available for five minutes more to answer your questions. And after that, I have to take the class of my fourth semester. So I will be again live at four for my next class. But so far, uh, I will be answering at least five questions if you have uploaded these questions. Uh, so let me see uh, if the questions are there. Uh, in the comment section, I don't find any of the questions being portrayed by the students. So I'll wait just for one moment in order to see if there is any question. I may be answering to that. If there is no question, I shall be closing this stream. But before I close the stream, I want to advise my students that they should write their impressions, their understanding of the characters of the places and that of Lenny and Shanta and her lovers and the political debate that we have done today. Uh, that, that will be very good if some of you are preparing these lessons and uh, these lessons uh, may be written by you and uploaded to me through WhatsApp because I will be expecting all that. If it doesn't happen, I will also stop teaching you because uh, it, it needs a type of feedback on your part. So every student who is registered with me, uh, that person is required to send on my WhatsApp numbers the impressions there. Uh, the jars, the question comes from Rabia Iram. What's the significance of the jars? So far, if we talk with reference to Lenny, Lenny is the child shown in this narration and, uh, uh, and the girl child. So these people, the girl children are very specific or used to be very specific about the things which are you know, fragile things which are shining or the things which can be kept safely. So Lenny takes care of these jars and wants to have them with her all the time. She doesn't want anybody to look at that. She wants to keep them for, her, for herself. And that's why she's keeping them secret. She's trying to have them, trying to save them as well. So this is more the girlish attitude of Lenny that she wants to keep the things secret and safe. At this moment, I can say this much. You should go to the chapter, read about them. You'll find lots of interesting things into that. Well, I don't see any more questions. Possibly students uh, don't want to ask the question in my respect, in my honor, possibly, maybe so. Uh, but if the question is raised, definitely I will answer. No question is coming up, so that's why I shall be closing here. Uh, Hafsa Khan uh, is not raising a question. She's simply giving a comment. So that is why no comment on that. Anyways, thank you very much, all of you, that you people have followed me. The same video will be uploaded to YouTube. So if one wants to repeat, one can go for that as well and watch it on my YouTube channel as well. But I would suggest you people that if you watch that, do not fail to subscribe because we need the number of subscriptions increased to the maximum level. That is beneficial for all of us, for my students, as well as for me, for the education and academic community as well. So with these words, thank you all of you. I'm saying goodbye.